Hello and welcome to Power Up Hawaii, where Hawaii comes together to walk towards a clean, renewable, and just energy future. I am your host, Raya Salter. I'm an energy attorney, clean energy advocate, and community outreach specialist. I'm also the principal attorney of Imagine Power LLC. Today we're going to take a look at some important energy and utility news uh, from Hawaii, around the country, and the world as reported in the last week. We will start this morning's reporting, or this afternoon's reporting, ah, we will start with this morning's reporting from Utility Dive, uh, one of the most up-to-date sources. I'd like to um, bring you guys uh, information from Utility Dive. So, Unicos has signed an agreement with the Kodiak Electric Association, or KEA, in Alaska to upgrade a three megawatt battery energy storage system on the island. KEA in 2007 set a goal of producing 95% of its energy from renewable sources by 2020 in order to reduce its reliance on diesel fuel and lower energy costs for customers. So in 2014, the utility met and surpassed that goal, generating 99.7% of its energy from renewables. And a total of 14% of the total comes from wind power, with the rest coming from KEA's Terror Lake hydropower plant. As quoted um, by a utility executive there, we realized early on that battery storage is the best solution to help us achieve these goals and that Unicos is a company with the right technology and expertise as well as a passion for clean energy and affordable energy. Darren Scott, president and CEO of KEA, said in the statement. So, Battery energy storage is catching on quickly in island economies, which often endure high power prices because we must import fuel for, uh, our, to use to burn in conventional um, power plants. So I'm, I'm always going to bring you stories about um, storage and renewable energy on islands um, that are looking to make that transition away from fossil fuel. Um, here is another example. Alaska is another place. Extremely high energy costs. Um, well, sometimes extremely high energy costs. On um, parts of Alaska, they have oil and um, people in the community actually re receive a subsidy. But transporting oil, especially for island economies, is a tremendous challenge. So um, it's something that we always want to keep our eye on. Um, what is the value in battery storage? What is the value of battery storage plus renewables? Um, and we shall see, you know, as islands um, seek to turn 100% um, renewables, as we do here in Hawaii um, by 2045. Uh, moving on to a story about Kauai. Oh, actually, I think this is a continuation. In 2015, the Kauai Island Energy Cooperative in Hawaii signed a power purchase agreement for the first fully dispatchable solar, solar plus storage system in the nation, and earlier this year signed another similar PPA for nearly 30% less than the 2015 deal. So that was in the story itself. It was contrasting the deal that's happening um, on this island in Alaska to what's happening in Kauai. Um, I think another just really important point as we seek to uh, make that transition away from uh, fossil fuel is really the importance, the economic imperative of lowering costs for customers. Um, I think it's extremely important that we do not have clean and renewable energy at, um, at any cost. Um, customers, especially low-income customers, really need relief um, from high energy prices, um, especially in Hawaii, um, some of the highest energy poverty in the entire country and especially islands. It includes islands in Hawaii, islands in the rest of the United States and the territories like American Samoa, islands in the Pacific and the Caribbean. So moving along to what is extremely disheartening, frankly, news um, uh, from the Trump administration. So an early budget document from President Trump would slash funding at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency by about 25 percent, according to media reports, and would consider laying off about 20 percent of the agency's workforce. The reductions would reportedly not affect EPA grants to state, local, and tribal governments, which account for about 40 percent of the agency's budget, meaning deeper cuts could be in store for the EPA's enforcement efforts, Bloomberg reports. 
Environmentalists say they do not believe the EPA would be able to deliver on its core mission of protecting the nation's air, water, and health under the proposed budget reductions. So this is something that's not a surprise. Um, uh, President Trump campaigned on ending the EPA, slashing the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, and I think it's important, and um, this is a bit of editorializing um, as somebody who is a clean energy and uh, um, uh, environmental advocate, to remember um, what some of the EPA's core function is. I feel that the EPA has been politicized um, and, uh, and climate science and climate has been politicized um, in, in, in large part due to you know, the concept of a war on coal, of a war on coal jobs. But I think it's really important that everyone remember that the Environmental Protection Agency is much more um, than regulating carbon emissions, as we know. These are the folks that um, enforce our laws that are designed to protect our air, our water, our lands, and many other areas. So um, it is, um, while you know, some may have a point about um, sometimes regulations can have unintended consequences, sometimes regulations can um, be frustrating to business or environmental um, interests, um, simply ending the EPA for ending the EPA's sake, um, I think is a terrible mistake. Um, I think we've already seen across the country um, a lot of places take for um, the, water, the water situation that happened um, in Detroit, Michigan, where um, lead is still there and is still poisoning a lot of the populace. Um, it's important to protect um, our water um, and our air um, to retain our health. And I guess the last thing I'll say is I think many of us remember, I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, in the 70s, it was a smog-filled place, Los Angeles, a smog-filled place, New York City, a smog-filled place, smog, pollution, um, uh, you know, um, uh, co-pollutants from steel, from coal. And it was regulation of um, and understanding how to tackle these issues that cleaned up the air and improved um, livability in um, many of our um, most important and fun to visit areas. So um, just wanted to say my piece about the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, let's hope um, that the agency is s still able to carry out its vitally important duties going forward. Now it is also, it's also in the news that some top Republican appropriators aren't embracing a plan to slash federal spending for the US EPA, the one that we just talked about that President Trump is um, outlining um, and due to outline tonight in his address to Congress. The White House yesterday previewed Trump's spending plans, which would make deep cuts in fis uh, fiscal 2018 for most federal programs not tied to national security. So as we spoke before, EPA could see its $8.1 billion annual budget cut by nearly a quarter. This was reported by E&E &E News um, yesterday. Uh, the plan is to um, increase defense spending, and as quoted by an official, this defense spending increase will be offset and paid for by finding greater savings and efficiencies across the federal government. We're going to do more with less, Trump said yesterday in a speech to the National Governors Association. So these proposed cuts are part of a broader Trump administration move to scale back environmental protections established by the Obama administration. Um, for example, Trump is planning to issue an order today that would begin to dismantle Obama's clean water rule. So the president has said he would offer more details about the plan in his speech this evening uh, in advance of a budget outline due to Congress on March 16th. Senior House and Senate appropriators, however, were noncommittal and skeptical about the cuts that would reduce, reduce EPA spending by $2 billion. Appropriators' support is crucial as they'll write the fiscal 2018 spending bills that carry out any potential funding reductions. If they are not on board, it would be almost impossible to have the spending bills with EPA cuts move in either chamber. So this is um, very interesting and is outlying another issue that is happening. Um, again, a bit of editorializing. Um, uh, um, according to bill pr um, budget previews, President Trump wants to make very large in, um, investments in defense spending. And he, in his words, wants to 
pay for them or um, help alleviate those increases in the budget by um, slashing other domestic programs. So it's important to note that programs like the Environmental Protection Agency, like the National Endowments for the Arts, um, and other um, programs really have represent just a fraction um, of both the federal budget and a fraction of um, the defense budget and these defense increases. So while um, you know they do uh, you know they do shave away at the tab, um, it's important to note that you know the significance of, um, of what they can contribute to budget cuts um, is pretty low. So uh, moving on to more conservative moves in the states about clean energy. Um, a Republican lawmaker in Georgia has introduced a bill that would restrict the state's utility regulators from making changes to energy resource decisions in the integrated resource plans filed by power companies every three years. So this is being done via, via House Bill 479, as proposed by Representative Don Parsons, a Republican. And it has alarmed solar advocates who say it will likely lead to less renewable energy on the system. The Southern uh, Environmental Law Center also agrees. One of their attorneys, Kurt Ebersbach, warned that stripping the commission's authority would have disastrous consequences for customers. The state's growing solar resources have already saved customers one billion, he said. So this is very interesting. This is uh, also something that's worth talking a little bit about. Integrated resource planning, which is not necessarily required in every state and has had a um, checkered history some at times in various jurisdictions when it was required, um, yet and still is, um, I think, can just be compared to an important moment when a state really tries to look at all of the resources um, at, you know, under its control to see, you know, what will the energy mix look like? Where are we going to get our power? It's sort of one of the, uh, one of the best opportunities to take a um, holistic look at the energy system. Um, and while that, you know, that is something uh, as an advocate, I think that um, I have um, said many times. I've said it uh, here in Hawaii, I've said it in New York, we've said it in California. Um, and we need to make room under um, umbrellas of IRP-like processes to think about um, as much, when we take that opportunity to do some macro thinking in terms of where are our, sub, you know, where are our subsidies? No energy market wants to see a subsidy, but you know, what is um, a subsidy? What, you know, what type of wealth transfers are happening? What are some of the ways that we can create efficiencies in, in, in the energy system by looking everything, at everything at one time? And then when you do that, you know, what can you, how can you decide what crucial elements you know, are missing? Um, and this is something that's happening in, uh, here now um, with the uh, HECO Power Supply Improvement Plan. It's not an official IRP process, but it is a regulatory proceeding that is, you know, looking to take a long view on um, how our utility is going to supply power to us um, in the near and midterm um, future. So this is a very interesting approach, um, stripping an agency's ability to uh, review a particular, um, you know, one particular type of, of docket or proceeding or area under its authority. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we come back. Uh, we're going to take a break and then we will have more um, from Clean Energy News and Power of Hawaii. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Tim Apicella. I'm the host for Moving Hawaii Forward. And the show is dedicated to transportation and traffic issues in Oahu. Um, we are all frustrated by sitting in our cars uh, in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic, and this show is dedicated to talking to with folks that not only we can define the problem, but we hopefully can come to the table with some solutions. So I invite you to join me every Tuesday at 12 noon, and let's move Hawaii forward. Looking to energize your Friday afternoon? Tune in to Stand the Energy Man at 12 noon. Aloha Friday here on Think Tech Hawaii. Hello, I'm Marianne Sasaki. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii, where some of the most interesting conversations in Honolulu go on. I have a show on Wednesdays from 1 to 2 called Life in the Law, 
where we discuss legal issues, politics, governmental topics, and a whole host of issues. I hope you'll join me. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to Power of Hawaii, where Hawaii um, comes together to walk towards a clean, renewable, and just energy future. I am your host, Raya Salter, clean energy attorney, clean energy advocate, um, and community outreach specialist. So before we went to the break, we were talking about a move in Georgia to have um, that the, the governor would like to strip the commission and the regulators from being able to um, regulate the, a certain type of utility planning process. Um, that, you know, it's an interesting move. I also, I a bit question what the, you know, it'll be interesting to see what the legality of such a move is. I haven't looked deeply into to the statutes in that jurisdiction, but most, um, most of the um, public utility regulators really have a duty to, um, uh, to look at the, um, to look at the, to regulate the utility in the public interest um, and uh, make sure that there um, are just and reasonable rates and that the utility gets a fair return on the, um, on its investments. And it's unclear if um, stripping a, uh, a commission of the power to look at such a big utility plan would be something that could just sort of be carved out of that authority. So let's, we'll see what's going to happen there. I think that's super interesting. Um, so next, uh, another extremely important issue for people who care about climate change. So according to a recent study, repealing the clean power plan would have significant impacts on the United States economy and the health of its citizens, according to a new analysis from Energy Innovation, a clean energy think tank. tank. Now, rolling back the carbon rule would lead to $100 billion in extra costs by 2030, rising to $600 billion by 2050, according to the organization's power sector modeling tool. And the resulting impacts to air quality would lead to more than 40,000 premature deaths in 2030 and 120,000 in 2050. Now, President Trump campaigned on rolling back regulations, focusing on energy production, and undoing the clean power plan. He's now installed former Oklahoma Attorney General Scott Pruitt to lead the Environmental Protection Agency and is preparing a budget that is expected to slash the agency's finances and resources. Um, so this is interesting and important. Um, Energy Innovation is a, it's a group of uh, super smart folks. It's not necessarily a completely nonpartisan group. It's certainly a um, group that is looking to see um, the transition away from fossil fuel. However, I think the discussion about what will it mean for the United States to abandon the Clean Power Plan um, is very important. So what is the Clean Power Plan? Again, that were, were Obama-era rules that really sought to um, regulate um, the power sector and um, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Now, I do believe that the Clean Power Plan is what allowed for President Obama to go to Paris and um, make the um, make the pact in the landmark um, Paris Agreement because he was able to say the United States has a mechanism for controlling carbon and unless the United States has a mechanism it was hard to see how some of the other players were going to come to the table so I think that regardless of what happens going forward to the rule being scrapped we have you know we can be happy um, about you know what the clean power plan has done so far um, however it is important to note that you know regulating carbon, um, really you know reducing carbon um, and the co-pollutants, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and the co-pollutants that come with them, is a critically important both to climate and to human health. Um, and in fact, I think here in Hawaii we don't talk enough about uh, what carbon emissions do to human health, particularly in you know concentrated um, urban areas like Honolulu. Um, so, according to some statistics, it is going to cost us a lot of money to scrap these rules. Um, and uh, again, I think it's regrettable that the, that the rules are going to be scrapped. Um, and uh, we will need to see going forward um, what happens. Um, because I think that it's critical to note that despite the fact that we want to um, scrap these rules, um, coal's not coming back. And as the next story notes, the United States added 16, um, 15 gigawatts of capacity to the nation's power grid last year, with wind and solar making up most of the new utility-scale power plants. 
So this was the largest addition since 2011 and followed a 4 gigawatt decline in generating capacity in 2015. Additions last year included 8.7 gigawatts of wind capacity, 7.7 gigawatts of solar, and 9 gigawatts of natural gas. So the new projects offset 12 gigawatts of capacity retirements. Coal additions have been less than 1 gigawatt in each of the last four years. The first nuclear plant to come on since 1996, Watts Bar Unit 2, added one gigawatt of capacity in 2016. So I think this is part of the continuing trend, and I think if you follow the news, you've heard. Um, coal is not on the outs because of a necessarily a quote unquote war on coal. I think the, the thing that victimized coal the most was cheap natural gas. And now the cost of renewable energy is coming down to the point where there is grid parity or better with um, clean and renewable power to fossil fuel sources. So whatever happens with the clean power plan, the economics of coal are, are, are moving, are fading out and moving away. And industry and the states are not going to um, give up on clean and renewable energy because it makes economic sense. Uh, so um, we shall see. And I will add that I think and also, you know, somebody who um, spent a lot of time in Pennsylvania I think it is incredibly critical that we make sure that um, folks um, who work in, you know, coal and other fossil fuel industries um, don't have to, you know, head into even further sectoral decline. Uh, and I think that's important. I think that's it's the responsibility um, of the states and of the U.S. government to um, to take that view that can help folks um, um, and help. Um, help folks um, move forward without um, a ill-fated attempt to double down on coal. Um, so it looks like soon uh, President Trump will have um, key cabinet folks um, in, uh, installed in energy. The U.S. Senate will soon vote on uh, Representative Zinke's nomination to lead the Department of the Interior after lawmakers voted 67 to 31 to limit debate. Senators are also expected to vote on the nomination of former Texas Governor Rick Perry to lead the Department of Energy. While Democrats have delayed voting on the nominees, both are expected to be confirmed. A vote on Sinki could come as early as Wednesday morning, according to Politico, with Perry's confirmation likely following the, uh, the end of the week. Once Perry is installed at DOE, Energy Wire reports, um, Brian McCormick, Vice President of Political and External Affairs at the Edison Electric Institute, will be brought on board as the new Chief of Staff. Um, EEI is a trade group for U.S. investor-owned utilities. Um, so, very interesting. Um, we've reported before. I, you know, I, you know, Governor Rick Perry, I think, um, came to a growing awareness about what the Department of Energy is really about. As we've mentioned, um, we had uh, Carl Robigo on um, our show right um, after the election, and he explained that you know the Department of Energy's main task is really overseeing America's nuclear stockpiles. Um, that's why we've had um, nuclear physicists at the head of the agency um, for the past couple of administrations. Um, and I think that when Rick Perry um, came and saw, you know, what really some of the core fo functions of the um, of the DOE were, um, he he rolled back on his previous decisions to um, uh, to destroy the Department of Energy. And I don't think I'm cynical in saying that you know Rick Perry has been a, um, a in Texas an advocate and a champion for industry for the energy industry. Um, and while I think he's going to um, take his charge seriously now um, of being our, you know, um, nuclear physicist in charge, um, EEI coming on to be chief of staff is a real signal that uh, industry is going to have a very big role in the de Department of Energy. And uh, that'll be interesting to see um, because I know President Trump has signaled that he'd like to ramp down funding for uh, renewable and other new energy sources, but I think that industry, uh, and this, by this I mean the utility industry, is interested in seeing some of that research go forward. So we shall see. Uh, okay, this is actually an important story, um, uh, an important debate, this next one we're going to talk about. So another academic study is challenging the economics of pairing rooftop solar panels with behind-the-meter energy story, storage. 
um, the study by Eric Hittinger and Jawad Saduki for the Rochester Institute of Technology was published earlier this month in Utilities Policy. It follows on the heels of a study in Nature Energy that said storing solar power can increase energy consumption and emissions levels. Hittinger said his study was undertaken as a reaction to the media coverage in the wake of the unveiling of Tesla's Powerwall residential battery. The study also takes on recent studies by the Rocky Mountain Institute that have predicted that solar plus storage systems will reach grid parity and defection will become an increasingly popular option. Overall, the researchers found that for grid defection to make sense, a customer must face high electricity bills and unfavorable net metering or feed-in policies. But they point out that many places that have high electric rates also have robust net metering policies. Hawaii, which rescinded its net metering program and replaced it with two interim on-grid and off-grid options, is the exception. So this is why I think that this debate is so important. Um, basically, these studies, I mean, there, there are competing studies that are talking about, you know, A, what, what will battery storage mean for actual emissions, emissions of greenhouse gas and carbon co-pollutants, um, according to some, it's not clear that storage is going to be um, as much of a, of a clean um, improvement as some may think, while well, that's disputed and I think um, debatable. Um, but B, when does it economically make sense to pair um, PV with storage behind the meter? Um, I think everyone, and that's I think why the Tesla Powerwall um, discussion came up, because I think everyone in the conversation sort of understands that battery storage is going to be that key, that missing link. Um, we know that um, solar energy only works at certain times of day, um, and unless you can store that power, um, you're going to need to get it from somewhere else. So we know that storage is the key. However, will behind the meter storage be good for the environment, and will it be good economically? The study then goes on to say, look, you know, if you, you're, it, Going ahead and going off-grid with your storage and your, um, your PV makes a ton of sense if you've got high energy prices and you don't have a good program for net metering. Um, and then it talks about what's going on in Hawaii. Um, and uh, it, I think, just um, emphasizes the importance of Hawaii coming together for a really good, sensible policy going forward. So that brings us to the end of another edition of Power Up Hawaii, um, where Hawaii comes together for a clean and renewable energy future. I'm your host, Raya Salter. Thank you and mahalo.